Hello, I'm Hat, and welcome to All Hat No Cattle. I am breaking the cardinal rule of YouTube. I'm doing a video on a Everyday Feminism article. It's embarrassing, but it needs to be done. Even though this article is a couple years old, it defines the current day thinking of the body positivity movement insofar as it pushes the horrible narrative saying that what we would consider valid and worthy research is in fact full of holes and thoroughly debunked by what turns out to be a really crappy article. This is a long one, and unfortunately, my script disappeared into the ether, so I had to do this pretty much on spec. Due to that tragedy, I wound up reusing a certain word over and over again. That word is bullshit. According to my count, I used it 11 times. That's got to be a record in some circles. Allow me to apologize in advance. All I can say is this article is, in fact, full of bullshit. With that said, let's get to it. Let's get started. Five reasons why everything you think you know about obesity is wrong, or at least really shady. Okay, who defines shady? Before we get into the main body, let's look at something here. This article was published May 18th, 2015. It is now September of 2017. And in that time, this article has gotten a whopping 23 shares. I think this proves just how desperate everyday feminism is as far as getting out there into the general public. If you ask me what I was most passionate about. Okay, they can't even edit their own shit. I should read, if you ask me what I was most passionate about. We haven't even read a full sentence, and they've already screwed up. Starting over. If you ask me what I was most passionate. Sick. About. As in my life's work, my drive, my reason for being on this earth, I would probably say eating disorder recovery advocacy. Eating disorder recovery advocacy. She doesn't have any training that she's speaking of, and we'll get to that later. She's an advocate. Okay. Actually, I might say chocolate mousse, but in my world, the two go hand in hand. I would love to see a picture of Melissa Fabello, but right here, all we have is a stock image. So who knows? And doing good, honest, genuine eating disorder recovery advocacy means deep diving into more than just the DSM, which is the diagnostic manual used by psychiatrists. It's basically the Bible of psychiatric disorders. And yellowed, underlined, dog-eared copies of Wasted. It means dedicating myself completely to body image activism as a whole because everything related to these two issues are interconnected. Some of them, in fact, completely depend on one another. And in order to paint a realistic picture of body image struggles as a whole, we need to understand how the colors interact, so to speak. How the colors interact. That is clumsy as hell. I barely understand what it means. That is to say, if my bread and butter is eating disorder recovery advocacy, you better believe I'm invested in dismantling diet culture as a whole, including fat hatred. So already we're off to the races. I mean, bread and butter right there, that's too damn funny. She goes from colors to food. She can't even keep her metaphors in line. And here we got fat hatred. So we're drawing the lines right there. We're drawing the battle lines. It's not advocacy for getting people healthy. It's hatred. Remember, folks, words are violence. So when Harriet Brown, who also, he stole my heart, wrote Brave Girl Eating, A Family's Struggle with Anorexia, released her new book, Body of Truth, How Science, History, and Culture Drive Our Obsession with Weight, and what we can do about it, I was itching to get my hands on it and was lucky enough to be sent an advance copy. That is one clumsy sentence. I had to read it three times before I could get through it. 
I decided to do a little research into this new book, Body of Truth, etc., 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 and here's what I found. Here are the rankings on Amazon of Body of Truth, How Science, History, and Culture Drive Our Obsession with Weight, and What We Can Do About It. As you can see, not that good. The reviews are great, but there's only 38 of them, and that's for a book that's been out two and a half years. I don't think that's very impressive. And now looking at the bestsellers rank. In all Amazon ranked books, it's number 205,782. Ouch. Number 173 in books on political science, sociology, medicine. Number 241, books, health, fitness, and dieting, mental health, eating disorders, and 1,637 in books, politics, and social sciences, social sciences, gender studies. She couldn't even crack the top 150 in these categories. So looking at the biography of Harriet Brown, it shows she writes about the things that interest her, from the neurobiology of forgiveness to early childhood education. She's been published in the New York Times Magazine, O, Prevention, and others she does not list. Here's the thing, though. She talks about being interested in things like the science, history, and culture of weight obsession, a family's struggle with anorexia, and a year in the life of a daycare center. Fairly eclectic titles. But what does she do when she's not writing these books? She teaches magazine journalism. I find a disconnect between her teaching profession and these titles. Exactly how much experience does she have in these categories? Sure, she can do research on her own, but I would expect someone who is giving advice about eating disorders to have some education in eating disorders. Call me a maverick. Back to the article. I read a third of the book in one sitting. In fact, I'm struggling to write this article because I want to go finish it tonight. That is to say, read this book. But within the first two chapters, Brown reminded me that there are so many important aspects about quote-unquote obesity research that the general public either takes for granted or ignores. Why is obesity in quotes? Anyone? Unfortunately, the fact of the matter is this. Everything you think you know about the obesity epidemic is wrong because we're being duped by a system that profits off of lying to us. Well, there is an obesity epidemic, especially among children. So why the quotes? Because, of course, her narrative is there is no such thing that we are being lied to about these type of events and we should see through the conspiracy. But instead of spending this article debunking obesity research, which you can find here, here, and here for starters, we'll get to those links later, I want to talk about five ways that power structures, namely economics, weigh in on what information we're privy to and what never sees the light of mainstream dissemination. You mean like this article? One, don't want to talk about obesity? Good luck getting that study funded. Let me be clear. Proposals for studies in the realm of health and weight that don't center on, quote unquote, obesity have trouble getting funded. I'm just going to give up here. Every time you're going to see the word obesity, it's going to be in quotes. Anything that's connected to obesity is going to be in quotes. So, fuck it. I'm just going to go right through it. And that's because studies on obesity are prioritized financially. Just like in the 1980s and 90s, when research proposals that highlighted HIV prevention strategies got money thrown at them, these days, one of the easiest ways to get funders to push cash in your direction is if you promise to return results that support the obesity epidemic moral panic. So now it's a moral panic and fat hatred. She's really piling on the scare tactics here. One thing, 
a researcher who promises to return results that support a particular view, a particular goal, those are not researchers. Those are hacks. And their results can be discarded outright. I don't think she's drawing a distinction here, though. I think she's saying that if you have a study that somehow points to a problem with obesity in America, or obesity anywhere in the world, or the science of obesity, she's going to dismiss it out of hand unless it fits her narrative. And I think any well-done study into obesity in any of its aspects is not going to support her narrative. For a visual of what that looks like, here is the National Institute of Health's list of funding opportunities for obesity research. In fact, it's estimated that the NIH alone is projected to spend $857 million on obesity research this year. Guess what? That's a drop in the bucket compared to what obesity costs America. You're not even coming close to parity with those numbers. And when you add in other research categories that often lend a hand in perpetuating the obesity epidemic myth, like diabetes, heart disease, and nutrition, we add another $3.7 billion into the mix. Well, let's not stop with diabetes, heart disease, and nutrition. Let's not forget obesity-related cancers, like stomach and colon cancer. Let's not forget about things like arthritis, inability to do simple tasks for more than a few minutes without becoming winded. And of course, the fact that you're going to die early. Obese people have shorter lifespans. They use more medical resources and therefore they do not contribute to society as much as a person who is not obese and who lives a longer life. That's a fact. These are not myths, my dear. These are hard, cold truths. Anorexia, on the other hand, the mental illness that you are most likely to die from, with a mortality rate around 1 in 10, comes in at 1.3% of that. Well, anorexia is a very narrowly focused condition. Obesity, on the other hand, comes with a whole panoply of concomitant diseases, comorbidities, if you will. We're also talking about a large number of eating disorders. There is no way you can compare anorexia research dollars to the entire amount that goes into obesity, which, forgive the pun, is a very big category. Meanwhile, if you go so far as to uncover proof that the obesity epidemic is bogus, it's more likely that your work will be unroutinely scrutinized, deemed implausible, there must be something wrong with their analysis, although I can't find any mistakes, and rejected for publication. Seriously, it's tinfoil hat time, folks. How can research that flies in the face of obvious facts, demonstrable facts about obesity, how can you possibly say that research should be found credible? Obviously here, a completely made-up quote. There must be something wrong with their analysis, although I can't find any mistakes. Bullshit. Complete and utter fantasy. And the reason for that is simple. If someone handed you a study, or even 100 studies, God, this girl loves parentheses. Claiming that the sky is actually orange, refuting what you've been taught to know, and let go more or less unquestioned for your entire life, you'd be skeptical too. What? What she's saying is, you know the sky is blue, and someone hands you a group of studies, like there would even be a hundred studies claiming the sky is orange, you should go with the orange sky, refuting what you've been taught to know, and let go more or less unquestioned for your entire life. No one needs to be taught that the sky is blue. It is blue. Where the fuck are you going with this? You'd be skeptical too. No, you'd outright dismiss it as bullshit. There'd be no skepticism involved. 
once you convince people of something, it's really, really hard to get them to change their minds. We're feminists. We know that all too well. Again, you know the sky is blue. Someone says, hey, you know what? I've got a paper here that says the sky is orange. How are you supposed to reconcile those two? You can't. It's bullshit. And of course, we're feminists. We know that all too well. Like feminism has any grounds in reality, in fact. It's all made up bullshit. Feminism is the sky is orange. Number two, you can't bite the hand that feeds you. How the weight loss industry legitimizes itself. Now, the funny thing about being a feminist is that the naysayers will consistently accuse you of being, among other things, a conspiracy theorist. I think that ship has already sailed. And while I frequently find myself arguing that no, of course, I don't think there's a boardroom full of white guys in suits with a banner reading Patriarchy Incorporated behind them, brainstorming ways to keep women and other gender minorities down. Gender minorities. There are more women in the world than there are men. A gender minority would be a man. But we're talking about feminism here. So how is that possible? The sky is orange. I do have a frightening newsflash for you. Many researchers in the field of obesity studies are funded by the weight loss industry. Okay. What number does many refer to? More than half? Three quarters? Virtually all? 10%? Many is a weasel word. It means just what you want it to mean. It has no definitive denotation. Yes, some of these researchers are funded by the weight loss industry. The weight loss industry has a vested interest in showing that their system works. If it doesn't, they're going to have to go back to the drawing board and figure out something else. This is not necessarily nefarious. It is, in fact, capitalism. Oh, wait, feminism's against capitalism. I'll let that sink in. Kind of fishy, right? In the world of, you know, research ethics, we call that a conflict of interest. I don't like conflict of interest here. I prefer under the table agreement. If the researchers are told you have to come up with this result, then it's bogus. And she obviously feels that all of these studies are bogus, that they all have conflicts of interest. The diet and weight loss industry has a huge stake in the publication of research that's in line with the maintenance of society's understanding of the obesity epidemic. It's what legitimizes their work and keeps them alive. Legitimizes is a pretty loaded word here. It's once again perpetuating the myth that all of this research is a conflict of interest. One thing I have to point out, she keeps starting sentences with and. That's not good grammar. I know I do it when I'm talking, and I try to avoid it when I'm writing. You hear it often because I use a lot of compound sentences. It happens to the best of us, but she's done it several times now, and in written form, where you can go back and correct your mistakes. And what an easy, yet terribly cruel way to do it. Convince millions of people that they can take their fates, literally their lives, into their own hands, despite the fact that good research... So, her version of good research would be one that fits her there is no obesity epidemic narrative. Research, for instance, that actually takes fitness levels into account, which most obesity research does not. Define fitness levels. Would you say Whitney Thor is fit because she can dance for a few minutes at a time? Uh, no. She can't stand on a pair of skis. She can't do a dance marathon. She can't walk in a parade without a mobility scooter. And she got fired by her trainer because she wouldn't stick with the program. That's twice she's been fired by a highly regarded trainer. Go ahead. Talk to me about fitness levels. The most obesity research can't back it up. Prove it. And then offers them a bullshit cure. Are all of these cures bullshit? And what do you mean by cure? 
Would diet and exercise be considered a cure? No, of course not. They're aids to becoming healthy. They are adding a new version of your lifestyle in order to become healthy. Some diets are fads. We're going to get into that right now. Three, the weight loss industry thrives off of diet failures. Now, you might be thinking that the weight loss industry must be successful in its pursuits in order to have all of the money that it has. With 45 million dieters and $60.5 billion, clearly it must be doing something right. You might be thinking, for instance, wow, Weight Watchers sure does have a shit ton of money and a lot of clients. That must mean their program is super effective. And if you thought that, you'd be wrong. Weight loss is an individual activity. It's up to the person themselves to make it work. I don't think it's Weight Watchers' fault that people don't manage to keep losing weight or to maintain a healthy weight once they do. Also not the fault of Jenny Craig. I know people who have done well separately on each of those programs. And I also know people who have lost a little weight and then blown up again. Let me repeat. Is it Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig's fault? Or is it the fault of the person who lost their way? You decide. Because the devastatingly angering thing about the weight loss industry, which includes everything from diet programs and gym memberships to books, seminars, surgeries, and pills, all promising you quick, easy, painless, and lasting weight loss, is that they're gold mines specifically because they depend on repeat customers. She's conflating a lot of things here. Diet programs can be successful. Gym memberships can be successful. Books. Some are good. Seminars. What's wrong with a seminar? Surgeries. Last-ditch efforts. That's medical. I don't see how you can possibly put surgery in the same category as a seminar. That's just bullshit. Then there's pills. Well, we've all seen that weight loss pills, for the most part, are failures. They come out, they last a little while, and then they're gone. I'd love for there to be a weight loss pill that was effective and safe. There isn't yet, but they're working on it. Who knows? Now, they're gold mines specifically because they depend on repeat customers. That's true. But again, not all of these things fit into that category of depending upon repeat customers. Surgeries are not repeated on the same person several times. What that boils down to is this. They make money because their products fail. And they do fail over and over again. Because research shows that only 3 to 5% of people can sustain significant weight loss for over 5 years. I have seen that statistic before. I have no reason to doubt it. And it's a shame. It's an absolute shame. I think that stat points to the fact that people are not doing it right. Fad diets, quick weight loss programs are doomed to fail you. And that's because you're looking for a quick fix. You don't want to put the time and effort into changing your lifestyle, into eating healthier and increasing your exercise rate. I know this for a fact. I have lost about 65 pounds in the last year and a half. And how did I do it? I got my endocrine system balanced because it turned out one of my hormones had completely failed. So once those levels came up, I was able to exercise more. I was able to eat better. And the weight started coming off. I did not buy a book about how to lose five inches in five weeks or shit like that. I took care of myself. I've mentioned before, I have a very close relative who has lost over 100 pounds on Jenny Craig. And they are continuing to lose weight. And I see every indication that they will continue to maintain this weight down the road. You know why? Because this person is dedicated to making themselves better, is dedicated to becoming a healthier person. Diet and exercise, folks, it's that fucking simple.
And these weight loss programs, promising you magic, but using buzzwords like evidence-based and research-proven. Wait a minute. And these weight loss programs, promising you magic, but using buzzwords like evidence-based and research-proven? Is that even a complete sentence? That's a fragment. Again, they can't edit for shit at this place. Most of their studies end, at most, after three years following clients. What a coincidence. Do I detect a slight note of sarcasm? I believe I do. She does have a point, though, as some of these studies are done quick and dirty. The companies who sponsor them want to get their money in and get their money out so they can publish their results and start cranking up the cash machine. That's not true for all of this research, of course, but that's the brush she wants to use to paint all of them. And so we perpetuate a disgusting cycle that does nothing to help consumers and everything to ensure that the capitalist machine via the medical industrial complex keeps running. Uh, yeah. Once again, feminism, capitalism, anathema to each other. It didn't stop everyday feminism from begging for money to make sure they weren't shut down. So I guess capitalism works when you want it to work, but when anyone else is trying to make money, then bad on them. Now, I agree there is a medical industrial complex because you have rising costs in the medical industry. You have rising drug prices. But let's remember, these are capitalist systems. They have shareholders who are looking to make money on their investments. And what brings in money for the medical industrial complex? Better medical treatment. Pharma companies make more money when they come up with better drugs. Yes, sometimes they raise the price on orphan drugs. There was the horrible case with the EpiPen not too long ago, but that was fixed. Someone came into the market with a better solution that was a third of the cost. Consumers win. The weight loss industry makes money off of our shame and guilt and then uses that money to fund studies that exacerbate our shame and guilt which leads us to pouring more money into the industry itself. This is hard to parse, but I guess what she's saying is it's a vicious cycle. People who are obese are shamed and made to feel guilty about themselves. So the weight loss industry makes money off of that, and then they cycle that money back into studies that exacerbate our shame and guilt. How much worse can it be when you gain another 100 pounds, when you find that you can't walk up the stairs in your house, is that what exacerbates it? If it is, then it's not the fault of industry. It's not the fault of studies. It's your fault. And round and round we go, ignorantly trusting a science that isn't all that trustworthy in the first place. Prove it. Show me some actual results that prove your point. I'm going to sit here and wait. And you know what? I'm going to grow a long beard before you come up with anything that is fact-based and scientifically significant. Four. Science is pretty great, but it sure as hell isn't unbiased. Listen, I like science. I'm a doctoral candidate, for Christ's sake. Clearly, I think there's some virtue in the scientific method. Otherwise, I'm wasting a whole lot of time, energy, and money none of which I have in abundance. A doctoral candidate, eh? Let's take a look at the author's qualification for passing judgment upon science of eating disorders and such things. She's the co-managing editor of Everyday Feminism. Well, that's a strike against her right there. We all know how much financial trouble Everyday Feminism has been in recently, so she's not doing something right. She's a sexuality educator, eating disorder, and body image activist. Okay, does she have any training in eating disorders and body image? Let's find out. Taking a look at her qualifications, she holds a BS in English education from Boston University and a master's in education in human sexuality from Widener University. That could be Widener. I honestly don't know. Well, both Boston University and Widener University are well-known in certain circles 
Boston more so, but Widner has quite a reputation as a higher learning institution, so there's no slack there. Then we have the final point. She is currently working on her PhD. I'll have to assume that PhD is going to be in human sexuality, as that is the field in which she got her master's. So how does that qualify her to comment on research into obesity? I don't think it does. Since she has a master's and is working on a PhD, it would show she knows how to read a research paper, but not necessarily one that's grounded in a hard science like medicine. Personally, I am not willing to give her the benefit of the doubt, especially when you look at how terrible her writing skills are. Can you imagine someone trying to get a PhD thesis through the committee with this kind of horrible grammar? The term ghostwriter suddenly springs to mind. But folks tend to have a funny relationship with science, as in, they tend to think of it as the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help them God. Anyone with a decent, skeptical mind knows that science is not, in and of itself, trustworthy. Good science is trustworthy. And there is a fair amount of junk science out there, as we all know. And... There she goes again. And while I'm into the notion that science is probably the most accurate source of information that we have, I'm not fooling myself into believing that science isn't unbiased. Fair enough. I'll give you that. Science isn't unbiased because people are not unbiased. And when it's people who are doing the science, their value systems can show up in their research. You mean like uh, uh, glaciers? are sexist, or the uh, solar eclipse that recently happened was racist, or that climate change is racist? Yeah, you're right. Bias can show up in research, but it cuts both ways, Melissa. Both ways. And... Dear God. And should it? Not necessarily. It depends on who you ask. Y'all essentialists out there, I'm looking at you. But the point is that it can. And when we're talking about an issue wrapped up in moral panic... There you go again. That matters significantly. As it turns out, study after study after study shows that everyone from doctors to nurses to psychologists, even those who specialize in obesity, have internalized implicit weight bias, which means that they are predisposed to associate fat bodies with ill health. You know why? Because fat bodies are not healthy. These are people trained in medicine, doctors and nurses, psychologists. I have a little problem with psychology in general. I'm not saying there aren't good psychologists out there. I'm just saying it's being proven more and more to be a soft science, and I'd like to see the research tightened up some. Internalized implicit weight bias. That is meaningless completely meaningless. Scarier still, they don't believe they have weight bias. You're saying they have weight bias when what they have is medical science behind their values. Medical science behind the fact that obesity and health cannot coexist. That's not bias. That's the truth. And when you're going into a study already biased towards certain results, that's bound to muck up your objectivity, which means that we should be suspicious of any research that unquestionably backs up the status quo. Um, research that unquestionably backs up the status quo? What does that mean? If you're saying that the research sticks with the facts and shows that things like obesity are not healthy, that they cost money to the general population, that they cause early death, and comorbidities of all types, that's not unquestionably backing up the status quo. That is good science showing that previous science is right. Aidan Paladin has said that the most exciting research result is when it finds in favor of the null hypothesis. That when your research shows that you were wrong the whole time and what you expected to happen is not what is actually backed up 
verify your findings. That's what good science does. It tests. Unfortunately, Melissa says they're unquestionably backing up the status quo. Complete and utter false bias on her part. She's pointing to other people like doctors and nurses as having weight bias, when in fact she has bias and she's projecting it onto all of this research. Do as I say, not as I do. Feminism. And look at the next sentence. We're feminists, remember? That's like our job. <laughs> I have nothing to say. Kind of like how it's researchers' job to do good science. But well, number five, health can't be operatively defined because it's indefinable. Yeah, this is a common feminist body positivity argument. There is no such thing as well-defined, scientifically proven health, according to them. And since there's no definitive definition from the word health, then any science that points to obesity being unhealthy is invalid, which is complete and utter bullshit. But the sky is orange, right? Here's a crash course in research. If you're going to measure a construct, you need to be able to provide your readership with an operative definition of it. That is, when you say X, what is it that you actually mean by X? Yeah, if I'm doing a study and I say, um, this is going to prove that the health of people is better served by their not being obese, that's not scientifically accurate. I'll give you that. But that's not what the research does. The research says things like, let's show the statistical fact of comorbidity in obesity. Let's show the statistics in the number of obese people who get type 2 diabetes or polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS because obesity can cause PCOS. Things like heart disease, joint destruction, those are hard stats and you can measure those. And that's what these studies do. But she's saying there's no such thing as health, so none of these studies are accurate. That's a fucking straw man. It's bullshit. And if you can't define it in a concrete way, then your entire measurement of it falls apart. And this notion of health, to which we all cling, on which all of this research hinges in the first place, is impossibly defined. Again, straw man. No one is out there saying this study will prove health is related to obesity. That's just wrong. What the fuck is health? Well, some have tried to define it as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, and others have attempted to give it meaning through calling it a dynamic state of well-being characterized by physical, mental, and social potential. The truth is that we're still searching for that truth. What does that mean? We're still searching for that truth. Those are decent definitions. They're all encompassing and they're not saying that you have to be at a certain percentage of this or a certain number of that in order to be considered healthy. It's an all around state of being. Again, no research is saying to be healthy, you have to do this. It's saying to avoid type two diabetes, you should do this. That's definitive. The basic concept of wellness as the opposite of illness holds ground, I suppose, and our biological imperative to stay alive and well, and therefore to aspire towards health in order to propagate the species, can be argued. Can be argued? I think she's trying to say can't be argued. Again, does anyone proofread this shit? But what really are the signs of a healthy person? And I'm sure you have some ideas. After all, don't we all have the same vital signs taken every single time we walk into a doctor's office? Those must have something to do with health, right? Yeah, they have a lot to do with health. If your blood pressure is off, then your heart is either not beating hard enough or it's beating too hard. Temperature. If it's high, you have a fever. You're not healthy if you have a fever. Weight. Oh, there's the tricky one. Wait, let's cut to the chase, sweetheart. If you're 5'4 and weigh 150 pounds, there's something wrong. You're not getting away with that in the doctor's office. 
If the doctor blows it off, you need a new doctor. You need someone who understands health. There's that word. But the issue with defining health is that the concept is partially socially constructed. Its definition by society's understanding of it has fluctuated over time and across cultures. So what? We're interested in right now. In our culture and in the present, it is not okay to be morbidly obese. But the issue with defining health is that the concept is partially socially constructed. Yeah. So what? Society has rules, and you're supposed to follow those rules, or you're not a member of that society. You're not a contributing member of that society. Just because it's socially constructed doesn't mean it's not valid. Its definition, society's understanding of it, has fluctuated over time and across cultures. Now you're just repeating yourself. It's a horrible point, yet you feel the need to make it a second time. That is, while it can be argued through an evolutionary psychological lens that it makes sense to value health as a society, what we understand as healthy changes. Again, so what? We're concerned with right now. Just because there was a culture somewhere in the past who thought being big and fat was socially acceptable doesn't make it right. Just because it happened in the past does not mean the present is invalid. For example, we currently think of thin people as healthy. No, not thin people. People with the proper amount of body weight. Thin people can be seen as unhealthy. I'm sure many of you at one time or another have seen a stick-thin person and thought to yourselves, that's not healthy, that person needs to put on some weight. I know I have. So, thin is one of those buzzwords that body positivity people like to use because they feel they can use that as a stick to beat people who think of fat people, who think of morbidly obese people, as being unhealthy. Well, you want everyone to be thin, and thin isn't healthy. Well, yeah, we know that. You're the one who's using that phrase, not us. In a time of abundance, and what we perceive to be overeating, perceive to be overeating, those who represent the hard to attain and maintain thin ideal represent health to us. Again, the word thin. But not too long ago, it was rounder, cushier, fatter bodies that represented health to us because what was hard to attain and maintain in periods of scarcity were those bodies. Yeah, and back in those times, people died earlier than they do now. That's not a good comparison. Just because it was socially acceptable back then doesn't mean it's right. We have evolved over time, Melissa. We now know that being fatter is not healthier. The ideal of health is fluid. But right now, it's pretty well defined. So you're talking about past societies, past cultures. Again, that has nothing to do with today. And because there is no agreed-upon answer to define health... Um, you gave two good definitions. I don't see how there's no agreed-upon answer to define it. It has been defined. You're just trying to use health as some amorphous, unobtainable quality that therefore completely justifies your bullshit narrative that being obese, being morbidly obese, is okay. Because we can't say, well, when you're here, you're healthy. You know what? We can say that. When your vitals are proper, when your height is in line with your body mass, when your mind is not working against you, if, you're, if you have a mental illness and you're being treated for it and it's working, you're pretty healthy. These are definable goals. So don't give me this bullshit that there's no agreed upon answer. And because there is no agreed-upon answer to define health, it seems a little ridiculous, or at least scientifically unsound, to assume that we can measure it at all, which in turn unravels the whole thing. I've already addressed that. That's complete bullshit. Take that and shove it up your ass. And here's your summation. 
The funny thing is, my guess is that those of you who disagree with this idea might be inclined to send me some obesity research in retaliation. Retaliation? How about refutation? Not everything is an attack on you, my dear. Maybe people are just trying to say, you're wrong, and here's how I can prove that you're wrong. That's exactly what happened when I posted about this stuff on Facebook. Someone actually came at me with, but let me tell you about obesity research. In other words, here are facts. And you said, la, 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 I'm not listening, la, 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 la. I'm pretty sure that's exactly how it went. But I have a better idea. Instead of insulting my life's work. Life's work. You're an educator in human sexuality. You are not an obesity expert. Your facile arguments eminently prove that. I'm not an obesity expert. I just know what I know. This is not my life's work. It's not your life's work. It's something you advocate. Stop trying to sound like you're an expert. Instead of insulting my life's work and overall intelligence by assuming that I haven't already read the status quo confirming research. See, there it is again. Loaded word, status quo confirming. It's not facts. It's, it's not actual evidence. It's status quo confirming. And you know what, sweetheart? The status quo is the fact that obesity is dangerous. It is costly and it is life consuming. The status quo confirming research that we're all accustomed to being bombarded with day in, day out. How about you go read the conflicting research? The conflicting research. You mean the feminist articles? You mean the handful of studies that try to poke holes in actually valid scientific research, in valid scientific papers showing how provable it is that obesity is dangerous. There's no other way to put it. It's dangerous. And you can't prove otherwise. You can point to articles like this, but that's not scientific research. That's babble. In this paragraph at the beginning of the article, the author wants you to find three links that will help debunk obesity research. Two of these links are 404s, but from their URLs, I can determine they were not scholarly papers. They were instead merely articles. Typical feminist research. There is one, however, that is actually a scholarly paper. Let's take a look at that. This is the linked article. It appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, Cases in Primary Care, on January 31st, 2013. It's titled Myths, Presumptions, and Facts About Obesity. Now notice here, it says it's a special article. I don't know if that's significant, but it seems to me a special article is not the same as a peer-reviewed paper. Looking at the background, many beliefs about obesity persist in the absence of supporting scientific evidence, presumptions. Some persist despite contradicting evidence, myths. The promulgation of unsupported beliefs may yield poorly informed policy decisions inaccurate clinical and public health recommendations, and an unproductive allocation of research resources, and may divert attention away from useful evidence-based information. Okay, interesting. Methods. Using internet searches of popular media and scientific literature, we identified, reviewed, and classified obesity-related myths and presumptions. We also examined facts that are well supported by evidence with an emphasis on those that have practical implications for public health, policy, or clinical recommendations. Here's the paper's results. We identified seven obesity-related myths concerning the effects of small sustained increases in energy intake or expenditure, establishment of realistic goals for weight loss, rapid weight loss, weight loss readiness, physical education classes, breastfeeding, and energy expended during sexual activity. We also identified six presumptions about the purported effects of regularly eating breakfast, early childhood experiences, eating fruits and vegetables, weight cycling, snacking, and the built 
i.e. human-made, environment. Finally, we identified nine evidence-supported facts that are relevant for the formulation of sound public health policy or clinical recommendations. Well, that sounds interesting. And here are the conclusions. False and scientifically unsupported beliefs about obesity are pervasive in both scientific literature and the popular press. Seeing as how this is supposed to be a refutation of obesity science as we would understand it to be correct, I have a feeling that these conclusions are not actually supported by any facts. I'm 100% certain that this article in the NEJM actually promotes the myths that the Everyday Feminism article is trying to push. This is the comment that I find most illuminating regarding this paper. It's by Michael Mahoney, a student in Vienna, Virginia. This report is spot on correct. This report's findings are 100% consistent with the real world evidence I see every day in my clinic. I run an all natural weight loss center and have no ties to any manufacturer of unhealthy foods or to the pharma industry. An all natural weight loss center. That sounds like a lot of woo to me. It gets better. If you want support for many of these findings, take a look at Robert Lustig's book, Fat Chance, or at Gary Taub's book, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It. A calorie is not just a calorie. It's not about the law of thermodynamics, and people don't choose to be fat. That's a lot of crap. A calorie is a calorie. It is about the laws of thermodynamics, and people can and often do choose to be fat. You can't eat more fruit, take the stairs, and expect the weight to drop off. Yeah, you can. I think this guy is into that nutritional psychology crap. So much of what we are taught is demonstrably false. Kudos to the authors for debunking some of the nonsensical myths that only make the obesity problem worse. He has got his nose so far up the author's ass, it's pathetic. And this guy lists himself as a student. Not exactly 100% rock-solid credentials that I would look for when getting someone to review a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. It won't be easy to find, thanks to all of the reasons that I've laid out here, but I promise that it exists. Uh-huh. Right. Or, if you want an engaging and succinct overview of the problems, check out Harriet Brown's new book, which I'm going to go finish reading now. And here she lists a number of books, not one of which is written by a medical doctor. I'm sure each one of them is chock full of the kind of idiocy and delusional thinking that this article has been pushing the entire time. To all of you who made it this far, congratulations. You get the Iron Ass Award. As I stated in the beginning, I apologize for the repetition of certain words. That's what happens when you have to go without a script. That's all for today. Until I see you next time, be well. And as always, thank you for your attention.